Over the past years, Singapore Airlines has had to make many service adjustments due to COVID. But after this journey with them, I can say for certain they're back on the up and up. All the details coming up. Originally, I was booked on Singapore's non-stop service, but after some ticketing changes, I ended up on the direct service via Frankfurt, departing JFK on Thanksgiving Day. It should have been a travel headache, but it was far from it. Typically, it would be a normal routing via Frankfurt, but the second leg had an added 45 minutes of flying in order to avoid Afghan airspace, which is why you might notice that the Frankfurt to Singapore leg is late every day. I arrived at Kennedy's Terminal 4 three and a half hours before departure, expecting crazy long lines, but it was surprisingly quiet. I'm generally a fan of Terminal 4, which is dominated by Delta, even though I rarely fly Delta. Terminal 4 is also the home to a long list of other airlines, including Singapore at the moment. But now, we need to get to the nitty gritty process of checking in. Singapore had around 16 agents available for their two flights leaving that evening. I was able to walk straight up to an agent, but it was a long process. I had a final destination of Thailand, and I cannot stress how important it is to be prepared with the correct documents for your final destination. I had to show 10 separate documents, which were each individually approved by a supervisor. I kid you not, two passengers on each side of me were denied boarding. One couple for not having a signature on their PCR test, a requirement for Cambodia. One guy did not yet have his Thailand Pass QR code and the last insisted that he didn't need a prepaid quarantine hotel booking for Taipei. And so the agents insisted he could not fly. All of that said, the agents were truly the best I've seen, having to patiently navigate a system where every country has different requirements. My hat is off to them. Security was surprisingly light, and with unexpected time on hand, I was quickly off to lounge hop a bit, with the Amex Centurion Lounge coming up first. Many travelers absolutely rave about any and all Amex lounges. I'll be honest, I generally think they're okay. Comfortable seating, an okay food selection, and a full bar were all on hand here. The JFK lounge is two levels, and 100% you should go straight to the lower level. The Amex app said almost full as I checked in, but in reality, just the upper floor was full. Down below, it was pretty much empty. Passing through what I'm calling the jelly bean stairwell, You'll find empty chairs, sweeping views, a quiet bar, and one other feature that makes this lounge quite special. Do you see it? How about now? The JFK lounge actually has a speakeasy through this unassuming door. The atmosphere is completely different inside, and I was perhaps a bit too comfortable during my stay here. I suggest to get here as fast as you can and while you can actually still get a seat before everyone knows about it. After an hour, I passed by the non-stop flights gate and headed to the Virgin Atlantic Clubhouse. Singapore uses the clubhouse for their business and first passengers departing JFK, and it was phenomenal. Inviting, quirky but comfortable, with truly top-rate staff. There are a wide variety of seating areas, as well as a pool table and a few other Easter eggs. What really set them apart, though, was the food and drink on offer. Scan a QR code at your table, and you're given access to the longest F&B list I've ever seen at a lounge. The menu just goes on and on. I settled for a chicken burger, which honestly blew my expectations out of the water. Singapore has made a very wise choice in partnering with the clubhouse. Boarding commenced at gate A7 on a beautiful 14-year-old 777, sporting the Star Alliance livery. I just learned recently why SQ has a white tail. Do you know why? Originally, SQ kept their own tail colors on the special livery aircraft, 
as they believed the Black Star Lion's tail was not in harmony with feng shui design principles. And so, they compromised by introducing a white Star Lion's tail. Learn something new every day. 15K is where I settled in for the full journey. A bulkhead, bassinet fitted seat. Noise canceling headphones, a COVID care kit, and a bottle of water, along with eye shades and slippers were waiting at my seat. There were no amenity kits offered on this leg, though they were proactively given out when reboarding in Frankfurt. Let's take a look at our aircraft today. This 777 features four first class open suites, 48 business class seats, 28 in premium economy, and finally, 184 in economy. We all know though that not all seats, even in the same class, are created equal. So here's my rundown for this configuration. First off, avoid 19 and 21 A and K. All four seats are missing windows. Also, keep in mind that row 20, 22, and 23 are directly over the wing. So you might not be happy with your seat if you're planning to use the windows as your primary form of entertainment. As for the best seats, 11A and K are the clear winners, but good luck snagging one of those without status. Otherwise, the middle seats of row 11 or all of row 15 are the next best options for extra legroom. Unfortunately, as is all too common these days, there are no individual air vents anywhere on the plane. And keep in mind, if you're in row 15, there are some trade-offs for all of that extra legroom that you'll have. First, each seat in this row is outfitted with a bassinet. That might be challenging. Second, because of the bassinet mounts, the entertainment monitors are a good three inches higher than what would feel natural. The first 100 megabytes of Wi-Fi is free for all business class passengers with opportunities to buy more at pretty ridiculous prices. Soon enough, we are on a fairly short taxi to runway 22 right for this seven hour and three minute flight to Frankfurt. And while the 777 is not my favorite aircraft to fly on, the spool up of the GE90 engines is literally one of my favorite sounds on earth. Taking off to the southwest, we bid farewell with views of the Manhattan skyline far off in the distance. Before the first supper service, I browsed through the onboard entertainment with my handheld controller. In this area, Singapore's good, but not fantastic. There are plenty of movies on offer, but it gets annoying when there's only one or two episodes of a particular show available. Either way though, I was happy to settle in with my yearly dose of this classic. I adjusted my seat with the simple to use controls that are not easily accidentally pushed and a drink service started. The appetizer on this flight was a cold poached salmon with caper and lemon aioli served with a selection of breads. For the main, I went with the slow roasted beef filet from Book the Cook. Keep in mind, Book the Cook offerings from Singapore are limited but going to Singapore are extremely limited. Service was rounded out with a trio of fresh fruit, cheese and crackers, and a lemon cheesecake. Overall, a good meal, if not a bit typical. Bathroom tours are not usually my thing, but I will point out one thing that I always look for now as an indication of overall cleanliness. High touch fixtures. Are they full of smudges? Kinda clean? Over a decade old and still shining like new? It's details like this which I think sets SQ apart from their competitors. Somewhere over the Eastern Atlantic, we were treated to a stunning sunrise which literally made the engines glow. Around an hour before landing, we were offered a snack service. It was much better than it looked, I assure you. In descent, we left our blue skies behind and passed through layer after layer after layer of cloud cover, eventually breaking through the last layer just north of Frankfurt.
Our downwind approach took us out past the airport with an eventual final into runway 25 right. A gray and gloomy downtown Frankfurt was there to greet us as we touched down and then began our very long taxi to gate B46. Interestingly enough, the same gate I flew into on this very flight six years ago. Eventually, pulling in next to a Turkish 777, all passengers were required to disembark while the plane was refueled, refreshed, and the crew changed. We had around an hour to kill in Frankfurt, which could be spent plane spotting. Or if you prefer, you can make your way to the nearby Lufthansa Senator Lounge. The lounge is bright and open and pretty busy, with a variety of seating areas, many drink options, with a limited assortment of snacks to go along with your oh-so-German 10 o'clock beer. There's also an awkwardly placed first-class section smack in the middle of the lounge, I suppose for your viewing pleasure. Boarding started again a few minutes late, and we taxied out to runway 18 through a sea of fellow Star Alliance carriers. Before eventually taking an extended aircraft selfie. I suppose if there's any benefit to taking the direct service, it's that you get to hear the spool up twice. Once again through those clouds and ready for the largest meal service of the journey. Starting of course with their famous chicken satay and followed by a sautéed prawn and quinoa salad, which I've now had three times. Not one of which was enjoyable to be honest. All of that was made good though by the main, Bavarian style pork belly with beer sauce. But first, let's admire that jiggle courtesy of a bit of turbulence. If you love pork belly like me, you understand. If you're vegan, I apologize. The meal was rounded out with a chocolate hazelnut cake, which was supposed to be one of those, I'll have just one bite desserts. I tend to lie to myself more these days. The sun set in spectacular fashion as we crossed into Saudi Arabian airspace over the Hijaz mountains. One of my favorite things to do on an overnight flight is try to identify small cities we're flying over while in flight. If you know which city in Saudi this is, leave it in the comments below. As I mentioned earlier, amenity kits were waiting at each seat when we re-boarded in Frankfurt. Provided by Penhaligons of London, the pouch is actually a great size and quality with lotion, lip balm, facial mist, and perfume oil inside. Our final meal service, breakfast, started around 90 minutes before landing. It started off with some fresh fruit, followed by copious amounts of iced Americanos, some pastries that have seen better days, yogurt, and a really, really nice cold cuts plate, which I much prefer over eggs on a plane that were cooked 12 hours ago. Day broke as we began our approach for Changi's runway 02 left.
I've flown into Changi, I don't know, 30 times, and not once have I ever been on the correct side of the aircraft to enjoy a skyline view. At least, I always have the boats. While aviation in the US is practically back at pre-pandemic levels, that is still very much not the case in Asia, which you're always reminded of flying past rows after rows of parked aircraft. At least though, I can say I'm very happy the A380s have returned to regular service with SQ. In fact, this very flight will transition to an A380 in the very near future, giving New York a taste of their new first class suites for the first time. A short taxi later, we were at our gate, pulling in next to a baby SQ in her new livery. After a very organized deplaning, we were free to enter the airport without restrictions. So I made my way to the brand new Silver Chris Lounge, which opened just three days prior. I'll give a bit of a tour in my next video, detailing my arrival into Bangkok under the test and go scheme. But for now, let's jump into the flip-flop score. SQ has one of my favorite business class seats, when I can manage to get a bulkhead. But the monitor's at an awkward angle, eight out of 10. The service on both sectors was extremely attentive without hovering, a solid 10. From this ticket, I had access to the Virgin Clubhouse, Senator Lounge, and Silver Chris Lounge. How could this not be a 10 out of 10? I'm sensing a pattern here because cleanliness also gets a full 10. The website is easy to navigate, but their app has been glitchy lately when logging in, nine out of 10. Book the Cook is very limited on this service, but it's still a wide selection of mains, 9 out of 10. The appetizers were hit or miss, but the mains all carried them through, also a 9. The entertainment system is sufficient and had a great holiday selection. Just wish its TV offerings were better, 9 out of 10. Amenities were a definite improvement over my last flight at an 8, and it's nice to have 100 megabytes of fast Wi-Fi for free, but their data caps for additional data make the prices steep. 8 out of 10. Overall, a very solid 90 out of 100, and a great indication of where SQ will be heading in the next year. As always, thanks for watching and subscribing, and I'll see you in a few days with a new video.